Today's topic, being a board game ambassador. Welcome to another episode of Table Scraps, in which we present a topic related to tabletop gaming and then have a brief conversation about it with the live audience. Let's not waste any more time listening to this weird intro music. Let's get right into today's discussion. Hey there, everyone, and welcome back to another episode in our month-long experimental daily series, Table Scraps, where we discuss a topic about tabletop gaming that's been submitted by the live streaming chat with the live streaming chat. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get started in today's topic, which comes from viewer Jonathan Detmer, who says... There's a few things more satisfying than telling someone your hobby is tabletop gaming and getting raised eyebrows that look to say, that's a hobby. Then introducing them to modern board gaming and waiting for that moment when they say, oh, that was fun, let's play again. I started playing games a few days a week ago. No, I didn't do that at all. I started playing games a few days a week at work during lunch with some coworkers, starting with Love Letter, Sushi Go, and Suro then slowly turning up the difficulty to Pandemic and Santorini. I was wondering, who else has had this experience? What were the gateway games they used to introduce newbies to the hobby? Also, what are the difficulties when adding budding new gamers to an already seasoned gaming group? Ooh, excellent questions there, Jonathan, and let's dig right in. So let's start with your first question here about what gateway games we use to introduce new people to the hobby. Well, for, for a while now, actually, my gateway introductory go-to game has been Camel Up. Uh, it's a silly camel racing game. It can play up to eight players, so it scales really well when you have a larger group. And on the game, players are taking simple actions. And it's always gone over really well. Um, I really recommend Camel Up because, like I said, it's, it's it's different. It's silly. The mechanism where the camels stack on top of each other or underneath, and then whatever camel is on top is actually in the lead, it can lead to some moments of, oh, interesting, when you're playing. And there's also a lot of variety with the betting, the moving the camels, and also laying the traps or the little bonuses on the track. There's a little bit of different approaches the players can take with it. One of my favorite stories about introducing Camel Up to people is uh, one of my really good friends, uh, his wife, uh, their parents are live in Mexico. In fact, they don't even speak English, they only speak Spanish. And they went down to visit them earlier this year and they asked if they could borrow my copy of Camel Up to take down and introduce to them as a gateway game themselves. So, so yeah, I did. And you know, so these are you know older people who are not gamers that aren't even uh, English speakers. And my friends introduced the game to them, and it went over so well. I got a text message from them while they were down there saying, "Hey, um, do you mind if we?" give them this copy of the game and just leave it here. And, and that was actually such a proud moment as a gamer, having a game that I introduced to someone that they in turn then wanted to introduce to someone else. And that other person enjoyed it so much that they asked to keep the copy of it because they couldn't get it locally there, didn't have access to it. And, and just, you know, that whole scenario is kind of what being a board game ambassador is all about. That's like, you know, that is the gold standard of the the board game ambassador experience that you could possibly have. It was really, really, really satisfying and, and uh, it was just really great to see gaming spread in that way. So that is my go-to game when it comes to uh, board gaming and some of the experiences I've had with it. Let's turn it over to the YouTube chat to get a half dozen or so examples from the chat peoples of what you've done with, with Gateway Gaming and also what whatever your other question was there, Jonathan. Uh, the difficulties when adding budding new gamers to an already seasoned gaming group. Let's find out more from the chat. Let's start with a comment from Stefan, who says, I guess I'm really horrible at gateway games. I only start to like games for medium weight usually, but something silly like Galaxy Trucker, Robo Rally or the likes can do the job. You know, I think that if we are in the position of being the board game ambassador um, to others, it really does help if we are open to a lot of different gaming experiences because 
y- y- Stefan, you make a good point. Having a few wild card games in your arsenal that you truly do enjoy can really be helpful in showing the hobby to others because you never know what people are going to pick up on. They might really want to try a Euro, you know, medium weight Euro game, but that might be overwhelming. And then picking up something weird like whatever the weirdest game I can think of off the top of my shelf that's not a Euro game, but I didn't, couldn't think of it, so I'm going to say... Or just picking up something random like Dead Last, which is a simple little player elimination card game. You know, anything like that can help to set the stage and um, show them games they otherwise might not, have, might not have seen. So keeping an open mind in our own game collections and experiences can really help give us an edge when trying to f- introduce others to the hobby as well. Kabuki Kid mentions, I have huge success with King of Tokyo, Lords of Waterdeep, For Sale, and Can't Stop. Yeah, I know Can't Stop is over 35 years old, but most non-gamers are unfamiliar with it still. Those are all fantastic examples, um, especially King of Tokyo. King of Tokyo is one that I use a lot, a gateway experience. Um, It always goes over well, but it's never asked for by name usually in in subsequent um, in subsequent gaming sessions. After I introduced my in-laws to Camel Up, the next time we got together for like a a family holiday or whatever, uh, my father-in-law leaned over to me and said, "Hey, did you bring that Camel Racing game?" And, And that was kind of a neat moment. Um, King of Tokyo is a good way to get the foot in the door, but like I said, I've never had people ask for it by name on, on subsequent gaming sessions. And Can't Stop is a fantastic game that also benefits from having a fantastic app. I actually play the app more than I play the physical game, and so the mobility and accessibility of the app version of some of these games can also be a really good way to introduce uh, non-gamers to, to, to the hobby. So don't forget games that have really good apps because that can be a really good gateway as well. Murr says, I use Takenoko or Takedo or King of Tokyo just to show them that a board game doesn't have to last six hours. And Camel Up is good too. Takenoko is a good one. Takenoko has a few extra moving parts. That's where you are laying out a hex map and you have these really neat chunky pieces of bamboo that actually interlock and grow and stack on top of each other and grow on the game as as you're growing this bamboo. And there's a little panda bear walking around. But there's also some dice and some little tokens to keep track of. And I have seen a couple of people's eyes kind of glaze over as they're being taught Takanoko. Uh, It is a good game, but it's one of those that I think, in my own experience, is one to have available in the arsenal for um, showing new gamers, but maybe isn't necessarily the one to start off with, because like I said, I have seen it have just enough moving parts that it has caused some people's eyes to kind of glaze over and they kind of get lost. And Takedo is another really good one. The nice thing I hear a lot about Takedo is that it goes at such a leisurely zen pace and the players themselves can kind of control the pacing of the game. So if they don't want to get into a really competitive feeling experience, uh, Takedo can be a really good game to to provide that experience. So those are excellent picks as well, Murr. Let's go to the next picks. Next, we have Zachary, who says, Jamaica is an excellent gateway game. Simple rules, gorgeous art, and a family-friendly theme. Uh, Jamaica is a game that I think is really underrated. But, and this is just talking from my own personal weird experience with Jamaica. (sighs) Jamaica is a little bit of an anomaly to me, because... uh, I've seen gamers say it's a good gateway game, but then gateway gamers feel a little overwhelmed by it, actually. So it's this weird, I like it and I want to introduce it to more people, but I have a really hard time making Jamaica fit. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. Your mileage may vary, but I still think that Jamaica is worth, again, having in the pile, having available. Um, But I've had mixed experiences with Jamaica, unfortunately. Ethan suggests, my mother-in-law is starting to get into hobby games and is getting just beyond the gateway. We taught her Stone Age a few weeks ago as a good intro to worker placement. Oh, Stone Age is a really good example exactly for that, that reason, Ethan. It's a really good intro gateway into the worker placement idea without being thin. It still has some meat to it. So yes, Stone Age, I agree, is a really good example of a good gateway game if you're looking for something specifically that's a little more Euro-y and a little more worker placement-y. 
E. E. Murr also suggests that I've also used paperback as a gateway game. It's how I eventually worked my way up to having my 80-year-old mother-in-law play and enjoy very much Power Grid. Wow! That is an accomplishment. Going from paperback to Power Grid, that's quite the spectrum right there. Paperback is a word-building card game, a deck-building game for making words, kind of a cross between Dominion and Scrabble, almost. Going from that to the big, meaty, mathy, power grid, electro-grid, mappy management game is fantastic. And it, that's just a testament to how you never know what people are going to latch onto and enjoy. For example, my own mother-in-law is this, you know, four-foot-six little preschool teacher, nicest little elf of a woman. She she loves Christmas. She loves Thanksgiving. She's just the sweetest little thing. But we have discovered through gaming with her that she has an incredibly, wonderfully vicious competitive streak in her. Uh, when we play Wits and Wagers or uh, other games, um, Survive, Escape from Atlantis, she is not above backstabbing or actually finding other people's weaknesses, and then just exploiting them as much as she can. <laughs> it's fantastic to see. And so it's a really interesting. You never would have guessed that she would have really been into these heavier, meatier, little more backstabby games, but she really embraces them. And it's really been, uh, it's really led to some really fun experiences when, when the family gets together. Trevin mentions, I like the big four, Catan, Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride, and Dominion. They teach virtually all the mechanisms. You play those, and you can play anything. Trevin, those are excellent examples exactly for that same reason. You're right. You got the, the worker placement. You got the resource management. You got the set collection. You got the deck building. Those four are a really good core set that I think everyone who wants to be a board game ambassador should have available in their arsenal exactly for that reason. So thank you for pointing those out, Trevin. Those are really good examples. Kabuki mentions, I've had even better success with Letter Tycoon over paperback for non-gamers who like word games. It's easier to understand, I guess. That is really interesting. Um, letter, I've played both paperback and Letter Tycoon. I, I personally, personally think that uh, paperback may be a little more accessible. However, it just depends how that player's mind works. Again, it goes back to having that variety available because you don't know what's going to click better with certain individuals. So yeah, having both available, I could certainly see them being two sides of the same coin. And some people may just latch onto one and some may latch onto others. And I think they, they both totally make sense. And I think that having some success with Letter Tycoon over paperback, yeah, I can see that. So Thank you for kind of pointing out that kind of two sides of the same coin principle that we might want to keep in mind too when int introducing games to people. And let's wrap up with a comment here from Sacha who says, it really depends on the person that you're trying to get to play board games. Do they play any kind of games? You know, video games, RPGs, card games? If yes, try to build on that and find the right game for them. Thank you, Sasha. I was hoping that that type of thing would come up in the conversation. Lots of times, as board game ambassadors and lovers of the hobby, we find games that we really enjoy, and we want to share those games with others because, you know, wow, we had a great experience with this game, and we want others to have the same experience. But I think even more important is being aware of what your audience is interested in. Trying to push a game onto someone who's not interested in it is not going to do as much to help introduce them to the hobby in a good way as kind of finding out where they're coming from. So I guess really just, you know, being able to put yourself in that person's shoes and seeing where they're coming from as a gamer is one of, I think, the most important things that we can do as board game ambassadors. So thank you, Sasha, for those words of wisdom, because I really do think that they are our wise words. One thing that we also have to keep in mind, though, is that we're out of time for this episode. So if you have any other game suggestions or introductory suggestions on how to bring new games to people, let me know in the comments below or over on our Facebook or Twitter pages where we can continue the conversations there as well. In the meantime, I want to thank everybody who's been so, so, who's been doing stuff. In the meantime, I want to thank everybody who's been supporting Pair of Dice Paradise's fundraiser page over on Podpledge. It's the financial support of viewers just like you that's making episodes just like this possible to do.
Till next time, I've been Chaz Marler, who, along with the live streaming YouTube chat, have been serving up some table scraps. Thanks, and I'll talk to you again soon. Well, for a little while now, my go-to game has actually be, be bees. I just throw bees at people. I say, let's play games or I'm going to throw bees at you. And after the stinging stops uh, and they get out of the hospital, uh, we play some games. <laughs>